Good morning. Yes, you did say Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Barbara Bynum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the forum. Um, if you are not on our forum email list, uh, we have all four of the facilitators up here, myself, and GDM Files, and Kathy Hevers, and Phoebe Benzinger. Um, little cards now that you can just scan this and sign yourself up to get on our email list. And for those of you who say, I used to get your emails, but they stopped coming, they are probably being filtered out in your junk mail. If the forum isn't in your address book, or if you don't regularly open the emails, your computer will try and help you out by filtering those out. Um, and you can look around in your junk email box for it. So, this morning, we're gonna have a great presentation about Westco. If you've been in Montrose since 2015, you probably remember that creating a dispatch that would serve multiple agencies in our community was a really big deal. And when that organization was formed, they, one of the first things they did was hire Mandy Stolzheimer to be the executive director. And she comes to that job with a wealth of experience. Prior to being in Montrose, she worked for the Jeffco Sheriff. And, and then she did that remotely from here. But she is a Montrose native. Um, she goes way back, lots of history here in Montrose. Her maiden name is Divini, which might be a name you recognize if you've been in, in Montrose for a while. Um, I know her as a mom because her twins are the same age as my kiddos. So um, we have known each other for a long time in that realm, and it's super great now to know her professionally as well. She does have three kids total. I don't want to forget the youngest, in addition to the twins. And, um, and she is um, an ENP certified uh, emergency number professional, is what that stands for. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about her background and also all about the Western Colorado Regional Dispatch Center. And then we're going to do questions at the end. And my colleague, Phoebe Benzinger, is going to handle Q&A because I am on my way to Denver if the roads are clear and there's no fire. So there we go. Let's give Mandy a big warm welcome. Hi, everyone. So for those of you who know me, you probably think I don't need this mic. That's probably true. Um, thanks, Terry. <laughs> um, thank you for the great introduction. Yeah, I'm Mandy. I am a, a native here. In fact, my husband's in the room. Many of you probably know him or recognize him because I think he looks the same as he did in high school. We do have three children, and we moved back here to Montrose late in 2012 after spending 18 years away, four of which we were in school and then started our family and careers on the front range. Um, I am the, the executive director for the Western Colorado Regional Dispatch Center. I don't get caught up too much in all the titles and all of that, but um, we are a, a dispatch center that provides emergency communication services across Western Colorado. Uh, I don't know, I know that, you know, speaking with Barbara, she asked me to give a little bit of my background. So I started my career in public safety with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office as a dispatcher, and I started that kind of as a fluke, because I was actually a project analyst with Oppenheimer Funds and pregnant with our children, our twins, and we, uh, I started to have some complications and then 9-11 hit and I was put on bed rest and by the time, is that better? Okay. <laughs> and, and by the time that we actually brought our children into the world, I had you know, exhausted all of my FMLA and had the choice to come back to work uh, immediately after having our children or not. So I took a year off and that was probably one of the best decisions and it was fantastic to spend that time with them. And when I wanted to get back into the professional world, we decided we wanted something that would allow us to keep our children out of daycare as long as possible. So I got into public safety having lots of friends that were uh, police officers and I started out with Dispatch, allowing me to work nights and weekends when my husband worked the traditional nine to five, or I guess it's more like seven to five, I don't know, something like that, but Monday through Friday. Uh, I am unique in that I have progressed my career, but all through 911. 
So many folks who are executives in the 911 profession tend to have a different background. They either come from the fire service or law enforcement, EMS, they have some sort of other um, land, yeah, ground level work. Whereas I started um, as a call taker, a 911 call taker and a dispatcher and continue to work my way up into the executive level. So let's get into this. I will have a presentation. I'm gonna hit on a lot of high topic things and go through it and hopefully open up the time for questions because I wasn't exactly sure what people wanted to know specifically about West Coast. So we'll go over a few things, um, who we are, our origins, organization, governance, what we do, how we do it, how you can contact us, the evolution of 911, what's next, and some of the challenges. That's a lot of words. So this is to say, um, West Coast was formed in late 2015 through an intergovernmental agree agreement and we started providing dispatch services uh, in January of 2016. We hired our first employees in December of 2015, and they uh, started learning some of what we were going to do sitting up in the conference room of Montrose Fire. So they were guests of the Montrose Fire Department for a couple months. We then, on November 1st of 2018, relocated facilities and um, started providing services for additional agencies. If you guys remember, this is back when the Montrose County Sheriff's Office ran a dispatch center, and they dissolved that dispatch center, ending all services at, at midnight um, on Halloween of 2018. And I'll never forget that day because my daughter got pulled over on my way into the office, and everybody knew. And so, yeah, it's like, immortalized in our, our family. She remembers that as well. <laughs> West Coast is governed by a board of directors. So there's 11 directors and one administrative director. So what that means is um, Bill Bell is our admin director. And the reason that he's our admin director is because West Coast receives many services from the city of Montrose. Um, things like human resources support, thanks ladies, um, IT, and uh, finance, any of those sorts of things that allow us to continue to function and not have to hire or incur those additional costs. So with that, the city of Montrose actually gets two of the 12 votes of our board. And currently, our chairman is John Trosky with the Telluride Fire Department. Our vice chair is Justin Perry with the Uray County Sheriff's Office and our secretary is Tad Rowan. We vote on new officers every single year, so we have the opportunity to see a different, a different set of officers each year. In the past, we've had former police chief Tom Chin serve as our chair. Um, our current police chief, Blaine Hall, has been our vice chair in the past. So every year that that can, that can change up, but Tad has been the secretary since the very beginning. He likes taking notes. We all know that's not true, right? <laughs> Our organization, we have 18 line level employees plus a records position, these are our approved employees. Four supervisors, <clears throat> myself, and then I report to the board of directors. We are considered a public safety answering point, that's the technical term for 911 center. 911 calls actually are delivered to a center in a different way than your traditional phone calls and those systems are, well, they're pretty complicated, and so we get a nice fancy name like PSAP. We answer emergency and non-emergency phone calls. With those phone calls, then we have to triage them. We have to properly determine an accurate location, identifying categories what we're being told. <coughs> we often have to provide pre-arrival -medi pre medical instructions. So, we help people know what to do in a medical situation while simultaneously getting an ambulance en route. We de-escalate callers um, in, who are in a state of crisis. As you can imagine, if you have to dial 911, you're probably not having your best day. And so our folks are trained to help you through that, even if you yourself are in a state of crisis. In addition to that, we provide emergency radio communications, and I suppose non-emergency radio communications too. So we have to talk on the radio to the folks in the field. Uh, we do that with nine law enforcement agencies, eight fire protection districts, and one ambulance district. 
Of those eight districts, many of them run their own ambulance districts, so they're running both fire and EMS personnel. And then we re maintain records of events. So all of the work that we do is recorded in multiple ways. Often it's the audio is recording. Well, always the audio is being recorded. We also maintain um, computer aid and dispatch notes, as well as multitude other uh, other applications where our folks have access to and must maintain records and get data from it. And we query input twice apparently. Um, and validate CJIS information. So that's criminal justice information. So we have access to those cool databases that you see in movies, like when they say, well, what does NCIC say? It's a real database and we have access to it. Um, so it's kind of fun. If we serve three Western Colorado counties and these agencies don't exactly match up, but of those agencies, eight of them are here in Montrose County, police, sheriff's office, the, the agencies up in, up in um, Olathe. We also provide Black Canyon National Parks uh, communication services, all of the agencies in Uray, as well as three of the largest agencies in San Miguel. So that's the Telluride area. So the eastern side of San Miguel County, all of their phone calls and their radio dispatch comes through West Coast. So our geographic footprint is pretty large. What I like to say is if you ever come into our center, there will always be at least one heartbeat in that room at all times. Our center is staffed 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Ideally, we'll have one supervisor on shift with three to five ECS as emergency communication specialists, and ECS one is emergency communication specialist one, so those are our call takers. So we have folks who are specialized in call taking and those who are both trained in call taking as well as working on the radio. So this gentleman here, you guys might recognize, this is Nathan Compton. He's one of the first employees we hired at West Coast. <coughs> so there he is working. I think he's actually just posing for this photo. Um, William, I think you took this photo, no? I don't know. But that's okay, there, there he is. We're busy, we're very busy. In fact, in 2021, we took over 23,000 911 calls and over 133 calls total. Our average daily 911 calls are 64 and over 365 calls a day that we handle. Um, we are also busier this year than we have been in the past. Our 911 calls are up 21% compared to first quarter of last year. So people use our service and we need to make sure that we provide the professionals behind and under the headset to, to answer that call. Mandy, quick question on the increase. Did you increase services as well? Is that part of the increase or is it just more calls? Just more calls. More calls, less people. We'll get there. <laughs> we went on the radio side of things. This is what our radio monitor looks like. Each one of these. Oh, wait. I forgot there's a pointer on this. I did say that I would point it at somebody. So each one of these little squares or rectangles is a different radio channel. So these are all inputs that our, our staff has to listen to and respond to. However, we have four primary law channels. So these are the channels that have to be monitored continuously all the time. Six primary fire EMS channels and multiple auxiliary channels, meaning that Meaning that while we don't constantly or we're not constantly monitoring them, their volumes are turned up and we have to listen for the hail. Meaning we have to listen for somebody calling us so that we can respond to them. So push to talks, that's how many times the, the radio has keyed up. Um, over two million push to talks last year mm -hmm. with, this is Montrose Police Department's primary channel. So as you can tell, our primary so Montrose Police Department, Montrose Sheriff's Office, and TRUG is a Telluride radio something user group, but this is the primary law channel that the law enforcement up in Telluride uses. So those three, those three channels take up the majority of our push to talk time. And then the pink or the reddish colors tend to indicate the fire channels. And not all of them are indicated because some of the utilization is low and they just don't show up on the graph. But as you can see, 
we are very heavily oriented for, on the law enforcement side of things. However, statistically speaking, so far this year, law enforcement incidents and law enforcement radio push to talks are down a little bit. I keep talking to Chief Hall about that. That's all of his efforts to try to streamline work processes for the Montrose Police Department are effective and we're seeing it, so that's a great thing. However, if you talk to Chief Rowan back there, you'll find out that they, on the other hand, are busier, <laughs> significantly busier. So I don't know if that's good or bad. Like, laws down, but EMS services are up. I mean, I, I don't know. So how do we find out about this? How do people get in touch with us? Well, we can get calls and get notified in um, lots of different ways. The traditional way, you can call or text us. And how many of you knew you could text 911? So this is a service that's been available in Montrose since 2013. Text to 911 has been available in this community since 2013. So you can call or text 911. You literally just type 911 into your text message, and the text will receive it. You can also call or text our non-emergency 10-digit line. And this number gets used, the 249-9110 text messaging gets used way more than text to 911. In fact, we only get three to five texts to 911 each month. Sometimes it's just us training our folks on that, so it's really none, but I throw them in the number. We also get notified by social media. I absolutely do not encourage this. We don't monitor our social media feeds on a regular basis, so therefore it's not an effective means to get help that you might need, but it's there. Also, all of the agencies, or at least most of the agencies we provide services for, roll their phones to us after hours. So if you were to call the Montrose Police Department primary number, you're gonna get an, uh, a message and it's going to give you some options and if you press a certain number, I think they have it as one, you'll get transferred over to us. <coughs> now, what's changed in this <coughs> one? And this is huge, this internet of things. This is changing our profession in a very profound way. We are receiving data from the internet of things. We're receiving data from automatic crash notifications. So for any of you who have a newer vehicle, about 2013 or newer, your vehicle is enabled with telematics. So in the event of, a, of an accident or some other sudden event to that vehicle, it can notify 911. Now you have to pay for that service, and some people opt not to, but it notifies us. And sometimes it notifies us in a manner where we're not actually talking to a human. So we're talking about artificial intelligence delivering information into our center on a regular basis. Alarms and security systems. How many of you have Ring on your home? You get to watch people steal your packages from your doorstep. So Ring and other services like that actually can deliver information directly to the 911 centers, right? So again, we're cutting out that human interaction, streamlining the processes, um, healthcare systems. So many folks have some sort of device where if they fall, Sam, you have one? Yeah. Yep. Um, if they fall, they have you know diabetes and their blood sugar drops below a certain point or whatever trigger they have from a medical perspective, there are services that will immediately notify 911. And sometimes that notification does not come again from a human. It's the internet of things. Um, Infrastructure management. So we can get information and notification that there's assistance being needed for traffic lights being out, for something on another video camera, for a myriad of things, and it's changing what we do inside the center. We are absolutely no longer a call center. We are an emergency communications center, an aggregate of information where we have to determine what's needed and send the appropriate response. So that leads me to the evolution of 911. The first 911 call was made back in 1968 in Alabama, and it was a big deal. And it was a secretary or police officer took the call. And back in those days, the call would come in to the police station, always law, the police station, and they would then somehow let the officer know. Sometimes they literally would flash a light on top of the building, and the officers had to just you know watch for it. And so when the light flashed, the officer came into the building, drove up, came in and said, what's going on? And, you know, then they would go help whoever. 
Well, that has changed significantly. Enhanced 911 came about, and Enhanced 911 delivered what we call Annie Alley, so automatic number information and automatic location information. So what we're saying is, with that, we were able to now see the phone number in which was calling us and the, the, the address from which it was calling. So the challenge back then when there was an emergency was could you get to a phone and call 911? And then when Annie Alley became available, you could call 911 and we would know where you were at. So the theory and that, that practice was fantastic. Until we got up into the 90s when cell phones became available. And that has just exploded that technology. So now we're seeing folks, they don't even have phones in their home any longer because we have a wireless device. And we don't even just have the phone, we have a watch, we have a tablet, we have a, I don't know, whatever else they come up with these days. Our car, many of us have our car, we just hop in and that can make the phone call or give us the data we want. But to that, now you can call 911. 911 is much more accessible to you as the person in need of help the problem is now 911 doesn't know where you're at, right? And so, I would like to do this. Does anybody know what your physical address is right here in this room, in this moment? Anybody, tell me. Tad? 333. 33. Yeah, I think three. it's 336. Okay. But you're close. Close enough. Three, so, so think about that. We are in a room right here and if one of us needed to call 911, the first question we're gonna ask you is, what is the address of your emergency? And we'd be like, Chief, where are we at? We're at 333 South Cascade. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how that has become problematic for us. So we are in this big transition to next gen 911, away from E911 or enhanced 911. And that is changing how we do our business, what we do, how we do it, who we talk to, how quick the data is given to us, and frankly, the type of people we need to do it. So next gen 911, the bells and whistles. It sounds great, right? Next generation. Well, I remember I started my public safety career in 2022. And I remember back in 2009, I'm sitting in a meeting, we're talking about next gen 911, and we're like, whoa. Sorry, 20, yeah, 2002, yeah, thank you, Terry. Um, and then 2009, and we're like, whoa, we are gonna get text messages and video, and oh my gosh, this is gonna be so amazing. And now, here we are, you know, a decade later, and we're like, hey, we're here, yay. Um, so, what does that mean? That means that Everything that you do in your daily lives, you should be able to communicate that to 911, right? Why not? It makes perfect sense. We send video and music and, I don't know, uh, my kids do more on their phones than I do. My husband, right? You love that TikTok thing. Um, he, but, but why can't 911 have all of that? Well, the answer is, for many of us across this nation, we're still on the technology that we were back in 1968 when that first 911 phone call was made. So, so the pathway to us is prohibiting our ability to receive and communicate with you guys and everyone else in our communities the ways that you communicate on a regular basis. So we're changing that. This is another one of our dispatchers. This is actually our center here. So what's next? Um, emergency communication centers. We're moving from being 911 centers to just what I said, we are emergency communication centers, that aggregate of all that information, those technologies, the way people are communicating. We are those folks that have to take it in, understand what's going on and disseminate it to somebody who can send physically help. And we are the link between the community's need and the field responders. Um, to do that, we need professionals that can keep up with and train on all the new and emerging technologies while still dealing with staffing shortages. Going into the pandemic, 911 has always struggled with attracting, recruiting, and retaining staff. It's a very, very rewarding position that can become very, very daunting and stressful. 
And so to that, we see a very high attrition rate. And we're working with the mental health professionals, resiliency training, and other things to help keep those professionals in this career long term. But with that, this technology is changing so rapidly that they are not only asked to answer that next 911 call, they're also asked to do training at the same time. And they're asked to talk to the folks on the, on the radios at the same time. So we're challenged with how do we keep these folks engaged and how do we keep them trained so that they know what to do when somebody calls 911 or when somebody's on social media and there's this new trick, right, to pretend you're ordering a pizza and don't worry, 911's gonna know that what you're really asking for is help. I can tell you that's not always the case because I'm not sure that 911 professional has seen that newest trend in social media. So it can be quite the challenge. That's why we wanna offer other means to communicate with us. We wanna offer you a safe way to text us in the event that you can't get an audio call out. We wanna offer you a way to send us a photo when you can't do a great job describing somebody because you're in fear of your own life. Or perhaps, perhaps you have um, some sort of you know, mobility issue, or maybe your vision isn't great, or perhaps you're colorblind. So when I ask you what color shirt is the person wearing, you're like, it's a great question, I don't know. And so if I can say to you, why don't you shoot me a picture, snap a photo and send it to me, then I can have a visual that I can clearly identify what I'm trying to ask for and send it out to the field responders. But all that comes with training and time. We also are faced with tough decisions that the national, state, and local governing bodies um, have to make determinations on. Here in the state of Colorado, there is no state oversight in 911. Can you believe that? There's not a single law on the books that says that your 911 professional needs to have a minimum number of hours of training. Not a single one in the state of Colorado. So your hairdresser has to go through more formal education than your 911 professional. Amazing, right? Now at Wesco we take a different stance and we say that's not acceptable. We're gonna put somebody to answer that phone call and talk on the radio who is qualified and thoroughly trained. We take great pride in the fact that we provide excellent training and we continue to provide continuing education. We have many, many hours each and every month of continuing education and professional development for the professionals here at Wesco. But we don't have to. We don't have to. And that's a little frightening, right? Our 911 professionals are, clar are classified by the Office of Business Management at the federal level as clerical workers. Yet, they have to undergo, they have to maintain their CPR certification, they have to undergo um, training and continuing education because they have to tell you what to do in the event that somebody stops breathing. They work under the direction of Dr. Walker's medical license and um, provide medical instructions. How do you stop a bleed? What kind of CPR do you provide? How do you deliver the baby? But they're considered clerical. And these are some of the challenges that we're fighting that we're hoping to gain traction for at the national level. At the state level, um, I'm on a committee that just drafted some legislation because your 911 professionals get called every awful name that you can think of. People call and they don't like what's happening to them in their, in their life. They're in a bad situation, perhaps they're inebriated, perhaps they're on drugs, and the person who answers the phone gets the pleasure of being the recipient of whatever mean things these folks want to say to them. Sometimes to the point where it actually ties up our lines for other community, community members not to be able to get through on 911. And we say we have a problem with that. We want to be there, we want to provide these three digit numbers, 911, best marketing campaign in the United States history. Um, we want to say, when you call it, we're going to be here to answer. But if we have people purposely abusing this, we want a means for our law enforcement to take action on that. So we're proposing to make it illegal in the state of Colorado to misuse 911. We don't have that law yet. We're hoping to get it. Other states across the union have it. And locally, we have local governing bodies. So we have authorities like the Montrose Emergency Telephone Service Authority, METSA, that collect surcharge monies, not taxes, to help fund us. In fact, through the monies that Westco receives through the authorities, 
so the Montrose Authority, the Array Authority, and the San Miguel Authority, they constituted nearly 40% of our revenue for this tax year, for this budget year. So they really help support us. And to that, they have to pass every single year that has to get passed that what those surcharges are gonna be. Those are those little fees, if you will, on your phone bill. And we need to have community outreach and education. So this is part of why I'm here today. So while, while Texas 911 has been in our community and available pre-Westco actually, none of you in the room even knew. So we've fallen short as a 911 industry. As an emergency services provider, we have failed to make sure that our communities are very aware of what we can offer you and how we offer it. So we're having a very you know, directed approach in the next coming years to get into the communities. This, you know, here in Montrose, in Olathe, up in the mountain communities, and just help people know, like, we're here, we're here to help you. And there are some challenges with it, but we do it with a lot of pride and we love the work that we do. So getting into the challenges, staffing is huge. Westco right now is at 50% of our staff. So we only have 50% of what we say we need in order to provide these services. And why? Well, I don't know. It's a good question, right? It's an excellent question. Um, we've had a lot of efforts on our attracting and our recruitment. So we participated with the Montrose Police Department with their recruitment fair. We put on our own open house on the 9th. We have went to the high schools. Um, I'm working with uh, CMU and trying to create some career paths for our high school students. Um, through college and putting together se several several different opportunities, but that still doesn't help us with the here and now. So challenging when it comes to staffing. It was a problem pre-pandemic, pre but it's just exasperated now. So that means that the staff that we have is just overtaxed, right? So they're picking up the slack, and I can't commend them enough for the work that they're doing. But we are beginning to see some of the byproducts of overworked and um, disgruntled employees. We're seeing fatigues, and we're seeing people have, <clears throat> excuse me, less patience with one another. Luckily, we're not seeing that come out too much on the calls, but with one another. And so we're trying to really engage in wellness and overall things to help them. So, um, Ashley, thank you for, last week was National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. It's a week where we take um, opportunity to celebrate the people that you rarely see but often make a huge impact in people's lives and actually brought us a live plant and and it seems silly but we work in a very sterile environment so having that is a great step um, we're looking to provide a quiet room a place where they can go for a few minutes and sit and and in a massage chair and just turn off the lights decompress for a minute and come back and do their job and um, we are uh, we have provided them with, with uh, certificates to soak wellness. So again, understanding that, that mentally and emotionally these people need a chance to decompress and let, let go of some of uh, those things that they're exposed to. Training is always a challenge. I think that a lot of lessons have learned. We've learned a lot of lessons coming out of the pandemic, and one of them is that we don't have to do everything in person. So remote learning and online courses have come out at, at a rate that we've never seen before. We have much more opportunity to provide high level quality training for our folks from the comfort of their own consular desk. But we also need to understand that we don't want to completely eliminate that face-to-face -face experience people get when they get to go to training. So finding time to send and, and to send folks to training and to um, encourage those conferences, things like that. Um, we are working, like I said, 911 Saves Act is an act that was that was presented to the Congress in the 2020 congressional session, and then COVID hit, so it went under the waistline. It's been, or went by the wayside, and now it's back um, for our federal lawmakers to hopefully pass. This will change uh, that classification for 911 professionals from clerical to first responders which is the first step in realizing that without people on the 911 center, the fire department might not be able to respond to the burning building because they, they might not know what is going on. So that's a great thing. And then continuity of operations. 
So we have to work with all of our partners, not just our partners in the field, but other 911 centers. So with, with that transition to NextGen 911, in November of 2020, Resco upgraded how we receive our 911 calls. We went from the analog copper wire line to an IP or an internet protocol based 911 phone call delivery system. With that, it opens up the possibility to receive all that additional data and information I talked to you about with the internet of things. But what it also did is it provided us the opportunity to have dynamic call routing in our region. Meaning, in the past, if Wesco was unable to answer a 911 call, it automatically just defaulted to Delta. Which is great to have somebody to answer the call in the event that you can't. Well, what if Delta can't answer it? In the past, the answer is, huh, they're very busy. Could you imagine dialing 911 and no one ever answering that call? Or the reality on the front range, dial 911 and get a busy signal? Because let me tell you, it happens. It's a reality. We here on the Western Slope, as, as directors of 911 centers, get together on a monthly basis and say, and we've said, this is unacceptable. So we're working with our basic emergency service telephone provider, for us that's Lumen, and said, how can we have a network where if the call that's supposed to land at Westco doesn't land at Westco, we can say land it at Delta. But if Delta's busy or they too can't accept it, we then want it to route to Grand Junction. And if it can't hit Grand Junction, we want it to route to Gunnison. And we want all this to happen for all of us. So we put together a proposal, and that's exactly where West Coast calls are supposed to go. That's supposed to be the top. And one of the things that we decided is that we too will be on that. So Grand Junction's 911 center, right now, if they can't answer that call, that call goes to Rifle. And if Rifle can't answer it in our, in our old system, it rang busy or didn't get answered. But now, it comes to West Coast. So we really have the ability to be answering calls, not only from our three Western Colorado communities and counties, but from all of Western Colorado. In fact, technology provides us the opportunity to route the call anywhere in the state of Colorado. And as our neighboring states continue to upgrade their systems, we can start routing calls across state lines, which has always been a challenge. And that is incredibly important when we start thinking about how we live our lives today. We don't live our lives in a building at all times. We're mobile. We live in the greater communities. And we often don't know exactly where we're at, right? We're just at the forum here in Montrose. <laughs> but what we do know is that we have technology opportunities to make those policy changes, but those policy changes actually have to come PUC, Public Utility Commission's rule changes. And so we are underway with some of that as well. So I think maybe this is the way to pass it off to you. Lots of information. I love it when somebody, when we have, when we grow our own, we heard this last week, and they come back to Montrose and, and give something back to the community. So I would like this time for if you have questions to raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone and be sure to, and uh, number two, and just talk into that so everybody can hear the question and the answer. So Andy, that's a great presentation. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, every time I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a frequent user of your area calling for burning and yeah. you know accidents and medical things and stuff like that. But I've never had to wait more than two rings before somebody picked up, and it really uh, was very uh, highly professional in you know solving my problem. And I can see by your presentation that the dispatch uh, Wesco is in good hands. Um, question I have for you is, what is the starting pay, or what is the average pay of a dispatcher? I, um, thank you, thank you, and I'm glad to hear that every time you call it, you get the service that you need and the response in a timely manner, that means a lot. 
So currently our call takers, our emergency communication specialist one, are starting at 40,500 a year. It's about 1947 an hour. And our dispatchers are starting at $45,000 a year. It's 2163 an hour. Um, I am working on a comprehensive salary study. The problem is, is that sometimes the data that we try to use and the, the resources that we use are employers council and municipal league data, which that hasn't been published yet. In addition to that, all the 911 centers on the, on the western slope, as well as many of them that I've reached out to on the front range, have had salary changes effective January 1st, as well as salary changes coming up in June. So, they, so those are changing, and they will have already been changed by that time that data comes out. So we are faced with a challenge of, are we still competitive? Because we have been in the past, but the fear is that now we're not. Are we still competitive? And what sort of adjustment is appropriate? So we do work on user fees, and all of our users are funded through taxpayer dollars. So we need to be very, very cognizant of those monies and where they're coming from, and make sure that we're very you know, fiscally sound with those. At the same time, ensure that we're putting out a wage that is favorable for the, for the skill type and the professional that we need. So, so to follow up on that, um, <clears throat> anecdotally, uh, uh, Gunnison McDonald's uh, starts out their employees at $18 an hour plus housing. Right. All right. Um, Starbucks is $18 an yes. hour plus college. Yep. Hobby Lobby is $18 an hour plus uh, retirement and medical. And, uh, Target, I heard, is now starting people out at $24 an hour. So clearly you're not competitive. I was just talking to Chief Rowan um, before. I don't think you should talk to Chief anymore. No, <laughs> he thinks so too. Uh, but he was telling me that, I asked him how, you know, how his staffing is going. He says, well, I can, you know, I, I need more money to put more firefighters on, on the street. He's fully staffed. Pardon me? He's fully staffed. <laughs> no. Well, that's a debate. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, I mean, he, he puts based on the amount of dollars he has in, in his budget. So you have um, you have definitely a need. You have problems recruiting and retaining uh, people. If you go to um, uh, to to need increased staff, increased wages, and so forth, how do you go about dealing with a board that has all those entities? Uh, to say, I need more money for staff. And how does that work? I mean, you've got, you've got the police department probably pays the lion's share, um, sheriff, and then you know, the fire departments and, and so forth. How does, it, how does that process work? And how does that board make decisions on, on actually increasing their contributions? So it's a lot of questions, but they're excellent questions. And that's my job to ensure that we are offering um, salaries and an incentive package to bring people in, and that's been the challenge. Because if Wesco increases salaries as a sustained cost, right, as a sustained expenditure for all future board members and entities, and so it increases their it increases their overall user fee to Wesco. In fact, our budget, 60, over 60% 60 of it is personnel costs. That's our biggest expenditure. So to answer that, the board wants data. They want to know, are you competitive? What percentile are you on and in? And we come up with a challenge is that, well, who do we compare to? So if you're Montrose County, you go out to like-sized counties, right? Right, Ken? Uh, yeah, City of Montrose, when they do their salary comparisons, they go out to like-sized municipalities in the state of Colorado. Well, Westco isn't a municipality, we're not a county, and we service three counties across a very diverse geographical land footprint. So we came up with an idea. Well, we're gonna say, we're gonna look at other 911 centers, PSAPs, they're going to handle the, the same number of phone calls because operationally, will change the workload in a center. And remember I just said there's no state governance on 911. None. It can be ran any way they want to. 
They can train or not train anyhow, however they want. They don't even have to provide emergency medical dispatch, pre-arrival medical instructions. They don't have to do any of that. So you have to say, we decided we are going to find 911 centers that have the same, with a 15% lower and 15% higher, number of phone calls annually. Then we're gonna ask them, do you, do you provide emergency communication services for law, fire, and EMS? Because we do. And then we're gonna say, what's your staffing matrix look like? And we're gonna hopefully identify enough centers, and then we're gonna say, now what do you pay? And that's how we're gonna identify who do we compare to. And that seems all logical, right? It, it's, it's a great plan, and it's not working. And it's not working because there's so few centers that hit that demographic for us. So instead, I picked those centers, and I said, well, Littleton Police Department, you take almost the exact number of phone calls that we do, but you don't dispatch fire and EMS, because that goes over to South Metro's fire station. So we'll go ahead and use you anyway, because you're close. And Pueblo, Sheriff, same thing. They don't have the exact same thing. The other thing is there's no Western Slope piece apps that meet that criteria either. But we all live here, so to your point, you go to Gunnison and work at McDonald's. By the way, my daughter was in college there and she worked there, she hated it. Um, but, but she doesn't wanna come work for me either, so it probably doesn't say anything. Um, so we're gonna just take a look at an eclectic group of 911 centers and we're gonna then present, I'm going to present first to, we have an administrative core team. So it's our officers and then any supporting professional with regards to whatever we're working with. So in this case, we're working with personnel staffing and salary compensation concerns. So we have Bill Bell on that. So we have our, our well, Tad, and then our chair, John Trowski, and our vice chair, Sheriff Perry. We have them, myself and Bill, we're going, to, I'm gonna to present to them and then that to the board to say, we don't have the data from Employers Council. We don't have the data from Municipal League, but I have, data from these centers provided by their directors or their managers, and this is what they're doing. Delta, Delta just passed their Back the Blue hacks up in Delta County. And with that, they're building a new building and they're doing lots of things, and I don't wanna get into their politics because I probably don't know them. But what I do know is that as of January, they increased their salaries, and their new cop manager said, absolutely, that's why they're full staffed. They brought their wage up, they were able to attract, in fact, they're full staff, they took down their post, and they're actually turning applicants away. But they're paying $3 hours more than we are at Wesco. So it, you're right, the need's there. And we just have to make a compelling argument so that people, the chiefs that are on my board, can take it back to their elected officials and that they can buy into that need and that they can financially support that need long term. So, Mandy, how long does a normal 911 call last? I mean, is, do you have an average that your operator would stay on a call? Do you have that? So that, that can change. Um, <coughs> here in city limits, usually just a couple minutes. Seven minute response time on average for the fire department, is that right? Yeah, close. Um, so we stay on the line often until the first responder arrives on scene. However, remember, we do dispatch for folks in the west end of Montrose County and they often live in much more rural locations, and so we have to stay on that call quite a bit longer, whether that's a medical response or a law enforcement response, but usually it's only a few minutes. You mentioned when you had your twins that it was attracted to you that you could work nights and weekends. How many shifts do you run? And when you did this recent outreach, you went to the high school, you had the um, big law enforcement recruiting thing. Did you find people who were interested? And if so, what kind of people are interested? Um, so mixed bag on our open house, we had seven interviews scheduled and all seven were no call, no show, it was interesting. We were surprised by that. However, we did have folks come in and we do have two strong candidates coming out of that. So a success, a success story. Um, we went to the high school and we didn't get anything from there because I think we were looking and talking with students who are looking for that summer job. Um, 
Well, some of the traits that we look for in, in an emergency communication specialist is the ability to multitask. As you can tell from my presentation, that's a very sought after skill. We need somebody who can communicate effectively. Can they talk to, can they talk to folks from every walk of life? We also need um, somebody who can type, which is a skill set that is not coming out of the high school. They're doing the whole swipe or talk, talk to text. Um, we also need somebody who hasn't partaked in, partake in or in, embraced drugs and alcohol because <laughs> we, in fact, um, are considered criminal justice employees and we have to have, pass all of those backgrounds and have a clean background check. Um, so we start whittling that down. And now we're asking people to give up night, nights, weekends, and holidays. And so it goes back to what's it worth to them. And so finding that balance is incredibly important. And, and I apologize if you answered this, but where are you located? I know, and are you going to be in the new police public service building? Or? So our primary, our primary dispatch facility is in the Montrose County Annex building which is um, on the campus where the sheriff's office is at in the same building that the coroner's office and the DA's office is. We have a lease with Montrose County through the end of 2028 in that building. We do have a backup location in the event that we had to physically evacuate or um, our current facilities or just needed extra space to work at and that is within the Montrose Police Department and will retain even after the opening of the new building. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Uh, how do you interact with the state patrol dispatch uh, and say uh, Parks and Wildlife and National Forest dispatch? Yep, so um, Parks and Wildlife and National Forest has a dispatch center here. They're not 24 seven, but we, we have direct lines to them. We also can talk with them over the radio. Now state patrol's dispatch center uh, is 24 seven and we talk with them well, all the time, both on the telephone and over the radio. And the reason for that is in the state of Colorado, any traffic accident that happens outside a municipal boundary must be handled by the state patrol. So we get the primary call, we determine what it is, and then we would then transfer that over to state patrol dispatch. How do you handle uh, <coughs> language barriers? We contract with services, we have buoyance, Voyance uh, language, it's like a language line. We just, par we conference that caller in and we talk to that translator, that interpreter. So the, the spoken language is interpretation, the written language is translation. So we have that interpreter um, with us on that call in the event. So I get a report every single month of the different languages that put, are utilized through that service, that service. And I can say in the six and a half years we've been in business, the only other language other than English has been Spanish. All right. Um, could I? Could you guys give Mandy one more round of applause? I think that was, that was good information. Thank you so much. And now I'd like.